Thanks. Hi. So I'm Isabel, I'm, and I'm a behavioral scientist. But today, rather than telling you much about the science, um, I'm going to tell you the personal side of my science, because our darling host, David, asked me so. And I've never done this before. It's really weird for a scientist to talk about yourself, you know. So I thought I'd begin by introducing you to my colleagues. So working with such wonderful collaborators, it's magnificent. But it does pose certain challenges, uh, particularly with the University Committee for Ethics. And so I really, really enjoy this work. And, but unfortunately, bonobos are not very well known. Um, bonobos are, together with chimpanzees, your living closest relative. Uh, they are our last, our, we share a common living, uh, a common ancestor that, that lived around seven million years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> But we also shared, you also have that ancestor, by the way. Um, so, and that means it's, it, it means we, we have a kind of evolutionary grandmother, if you will. Um, so you might be familiar with common chimpanzees. Common chimpanzees are famous because they are male-dominated, extreme, superb, Machiavellian politicians. They are very good with technology. They make and use tools, and they're violent. Um, they engage what's called in proto-wars, so they patrol the borders of the territory. If the males find other males, they can kill them. They will sometimes mutilate their genitalia. They can commit infanticide and cannibalism. Um, and this is really important because it has colored the views that we have on human evolution and therefore on the human story. So today, I want to tell you about the other side of the family, um, quite a different one, um, a gentler one. So this is the story of bonobos. Um, you can see that's the alpha male. He's grooming very gently that baby. Um, you immediately get a sense of the gentleness that pervades their social life. Notice the mother behind. The mother is, by the way, 42. So we are not the only ones who think about late reproduction. Um, and she's also the matriarch. Bonobos are ruled by older females. Females arrive to the group when they're young. I, they're foreigners. They bond with other females. And as they age, they rise in rank. Um, so one of, the key, one of the keys for Bonobos' extraordinary peacefulness is this kind of female-led society, which is not about feminism, but rather the dynamics that it brings. Because think about it. For a large-bodied, slow-reproducing animal, the worst that can happen to you is to lose, to lose your offspring. Right? So, and if you live in an uncertain world, the best you can do is to leave that offspring a tightly knit social network based on, good, on very good relationships. Right? So that kind of brings a long-term view dynamic to their social system, which results in this unique um, society that we find amongst primates. So, but that's not the only key to bonobo peacefulness. There are also others. That's one. Uh, bonobos are famously sexual. They use sex to prevent and to solve conflict um, in all gender and age combinations. As the primatologist Franz de Waal put it, chimpanzees resolve sexual issues with power. Bonobos solve power issues with sex. Um, but not all it's about sex, and I wouldn't definitely recommend this for the, the world, otherwise I get in trouble. Bonobos are also incredibly playful. Um, and that's why I study them. Um, play is a wonderful behavior to study. It's a biological mystery. Think about it. We know that the young of all birds and mammals play, right? Um, but play carries enormous risks. It risk in terms of time, of, um, of energy, and, um, and of, uh, physical injury. Animals where they're playing suffer a lot more predation and more accidents. Indeed, if you think about it, most of people in uh, accidents and emergency are probably there because of failed play. Um, so the must, play must be doing something in order to be there. And, 
And then it gets really weirder, more of a mystery, when you realize that in some species, adults continue to play. So it must be not just about development. And humans, of course, were the ultimate playful species, right? Um, but we're not the only playful species as adults. We, have, we share this trait with a few others. And if you just look at them, they're not closely related, but they have in common a package. They are long-lived, incredibly intelligent, they have the biggest brains, and above all, they're highly social. They develop complex, long-term social bonds. So I think play is at the root of this. And of course, it has crucial relationships both with creativity, with the capacity to innovate, and with the development of social bonds and trust. So I study bonobos because they're our closest living relatives, but also because they're incredibly playful as adults, probably after humans the most playful. So that's all really good, right? We have a wonderful question. We have a wonderful um, animal where to study this question. And that's great. But there is a problem because they, bonobos don't live in San Francisco, or New York, or Shoreditch, where they kind of should because they belong there. Um, they, <laughs> they, live, they live here. Um, and Congo carries a really heavy, long story, a heritage of human suffering and violence. You will be familiar with the reign of King Leopold of Belgium, um, where hands of people were chopped off if they didn't bring enough rubber. Um, of course, it didn't finish there. You have the civil war that just in the last 20 years claimed around 6 million lives. That's around the, the number of people that died in the First World War. And, you know, I didn't know this before going into Congo. I don't think it's, you know, we really don't talk much about it. Um, it hasn't stopped, uh, as I was saying, when I was called... Uh, but no. uh, Congo is, is, um, is called today the rape capital of the world. Uh, a woman in Congo is 100 times more likely to be raped than if she were in the United States. This means, this means that one woman every... Sorry, this means that 50 women every hour are raped in Congo. So, yeah, maybe not such a good workplace for a single foreign woman. Um, but to make matters more difficult, bonobos don't live in the capital, where at least you think, oh, I'm post, I, must, I might post my adventures in, in Facebook. Um, they live in the depths of the most remote, remote part of Congo, south of the river, of the, south of the river Congo. And somewhere within two million square kilometers of jungle, that's ten times the size of the UK. Um, so that makes them kind of bloody difficult to find, to be honest. Um, so I realized that going, in order, I realized that in order to study the origins um, of human joy, suddenly I had to go really into you know, what Con Joseph Conrad called the heart of darkness. Um, and, sorry, and, um, and I didn't have much uh, support to begin with. My, my darling supervisor told me that I would get nothing from it, and I would be like chasing the windmills, uh, and that, oh yeah, by the way, please don't die, because if you die, I'll have to do so much paperwork, and that would be awful. It's <laughs> like, great, thank you. Um, but then Don Quixote also said, but me, inclined towards my star. In other words, if you have a passion, Passion is a demanding boss. You just have to follow it. So I went. Um, and this is, <laughs> this is uh, um, yeah. Ignorance is often confused with um, courage, but <laughs> I shouldn't tell you that. Um, so, and this is how it looks like um, from the small Cessna plane that you have to charter um, from, for, from the missionaries. And we land in a, in a clearance uh, in the forest. Um, that's actually the big Cessna, which the National Geographic people built. So this is actually our Cessna is much smaller. Um, and then we're still 80 kilometers from camp. So we go by motorcycle and bikes, ideally, if the bridges are there, because of course now we found that the bridges are not always there, so then you have to get creative. 
Um, imagine you just lose all your kids um, in one go. Uh, eventually, at some point, you do get to camp. The camp is situated in a small village in a clearance in the forest, and you're, greeting, you're greeted by the wonderful, very musical Longando people. Um, and, uh, yeah, and that's Maria, my very good friend. So I'm there, but now I have to find them because I follow a community of wild bonobos. That's the point. Not only we know very little about these animals, we know very little about them in the wild because, obviously, of where they live. How do you find them? With the help of local trackers. These people are incredible, incredible in the forest. They just can read the forest. So I'm trying to look for the bonobos, but while I'm trying to look for them, there are other things that are looking for me and I must try to avoid. Not always successfully. In this instance, a venomous wasp got me. In this instance, a Congo viper attacked me, but I was saved by my hunter wellies. Um, in this instance, this green mamba came and greeted me in the shower. By then, there's been so many months, I just killed it with my water bottle and continued shampooing. <laughs> <laughs> Which maybe just talks about my state of mind. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right. Um, and then, this guy actually got me once quite badly, but just, I was just lucky he didn't get me with the task because then you kind of bleed out and there's no, no, no rescue within at least three days or so. And probably the most dangerous, of course, uh, to avoid um, illegal poachers and, and loggers. And then you find them, and that's wonderful. And you sit down and you watch, and you learn their names. And it's basically the job is kind of reducing chaos to a spreadsheet. Um, and it really looks like chaos at the beginning, <laughs> by the way. But it's done very slowly. And so far in three years, I've walked more than 3,000 kilometers, studying this community of more or less 30 individuals. You know, some die, some are born, some arrive, some leave. I collected about 20,000 observations. So I just want to share today some of my home movies, where I'll show play and its relationship with different aspects of, of bonobo life. So being bonobo, sex and play. So these are two females having sex. You see one arrives. It's called Gigi rubbing, genital genital rubbing. So you see the little one is quite interested. Uh, bonobos are highly sexual from a very early age. And they bond through sex, females do. Then now you can see um, they're playing. Bonobos socialize in midday after they have a peak where social life is actually distinct and they, they look for this kind of social theaters in a kind of similar way that we humans tend to socialize in the evening. Um, exploration and play. Uh, here you see a young female. She's playing with water in a kind of very slow, contemplative, almost as if she's kind of exploring the aesthetic properties of water. This goes on for ages. Trust and play. I'll show you what's called the ball game. You can see the female there. She literally has that male by the balls. <laughs> It's a kind of bonobo ring a rosy. Uh, there's actually a very important point here that trust requires vulnerability. In order for the male to do that, you know, he needs to trust the female because she could obviously rip genitals. As I was saying, other primates uh, rip their genitals um, when there is violence, but she doesn't. And in turn, uh, she trusts him be, uh, when that. Um, vulnerability is offered. So play and the relationship with trust and peace is something that is very strong and permeates Bonobo society. I'll show you now um, some the, the videos that, well, are still, uh, they're still unpublished and they're, to me, the most important thing I've observed is basically Bonobos encountering in the forest two different groups. And in the same context that you'll see chimpanzees kill each other or mutilate genitals, 
or commit infanticide, you find something very different. So here you'll see these are two males. When the alpha male of one group with the alpha male of the foreign group. Look at the juvenile. He's really curious. He's not, scared. He's not afraid. That male to him, he's foreign. He should be scared of him. But he's like, what's going on? And then now look at the arm of the juvenile. Look what he's going to do. Pinch and go. So he doesn't know that male, right? He should be really scared. But obviously, the, the atmosphere is so relaxed that he even dares to pinch like the foreign boss, so to say. Males of two different groups, not only they don't kill each other, also and groom, but they also play. You have the alpha male of the foreign group on the left. He's being kicked by one of our young males. And here you see a different variation of the kind of genital play. Again, a very strong demonstration of vulnerability. And there will be a fleeting play face on the, on the alpha male on the left. So this is extraordinary. This, this really could, couldn't happen in chimpanzee. So it tells a very different story. And to me, what does it tell me? Well, many, many things. But I think given that today we're in the wired audience, I want to make a point about technology. Um, we humans are, of course, technological creatures. And we share that with the chimpanzee side of the family. Um, but I would dare to say here that our next great revolution will not come from the technological chimp side. I think our next big revolution will come from the bonobo side. Um, remember that bonobos are extraordinary in their peacefulness and social cohesion. And this is brought by, I'm not going to say sex, um, but uh, this is brought by the integration of the long-term view that the female dynamic brings, right? This is does not say males versus females, but it's the integration of a long-term perspective with just not just only the short-term competitiveness. So they achieved this. And this means that their revolution was not technological like their cousins. The reason they're so different from each other is not that they had better technology. Their revolution, in fact, was a social one. So that's my story. Thank you. <laughs>